the foyer. Good evening. I'm Ruth Berggren, director of the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics. We're all so very pleased to have you here for our 12th annual Frank Bryant Memorial Lecture in Medical Ethics. In particular, I'd now like to welcome Dr. Frank Bryant's wife, Gloria, who is here with us tonight along with friends. Gloria, it's always good to have you with us. Our topic tonight is near and dear to our hearts, and it is especially relevant during Black History Month. Our Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics is very concerned with eliminating barriers, those that prevent people from receiving medical care and those that discourage people from pursuing health careers. Our speaker is a role model to those interested in overcoming barriers themselves or erasing them for others. And more on our speaker in a moment, but I first must go through some housekeeping details. Those of you who seek continuing medical education credit, please make sure you sign and pick up a record of attendance form. We don't need the form back, it's for you to keep, and in one month, would you please log on to the website that is listed on the form to claim your credit. For people coming from off campus, there are parking validation stickers available to you in the foyer. And now a few words about Dr. Bryant, for whom this lecture is named. Dr. Bryant was a much loved family physician and community leader in San Antonio until his premature death in 1999. He was among the first African-American students to graduate from the University of Texas Medical Branch. He went on to become an important advocate for the medically underserved living on San Antonio's east side. He co-founded the Ella Austin Health Clinic, where he was the first medical director, and he also co-developed the East San Antonio Medical Center. He served as the first African-American president of the Bear County Medical Society and the first president of the C.A. Whittier Medical Society. Our Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics is working to grow an endowment honoring Dr. Bryant. This endowment will make it possible for us to continue to hold a Bryant Lecture in Medical Ethics every February during Black History Month. So if you or someone you know might be interested in contributing, there are brochures that look like this with additional information about the lecture near our entrance. Our speaker tonight represents the same values as Dr. Bryant and is the ideal person to deliver this lecture. Introducing him will be UT Health Science Center President William Henrich. Dr. Henrich, would you please join me at the podium? Thank you, Dr. Bergeron. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the campus. It is a privilege and a pleasure to welcome to San Antonio and to the Health Science Center campus a friend of mine, a leading physician in all respects, Dr. Griffin Rogers, who will be giving the Frank Bryant Lecture this year. Uh, Dr. Rogers is the leader of the Diabetes, Digestive Disease, Kidney Disease Institute of the National Institutes of Health. And in this capacity, which he has uh, led for the last eight years, he oversees a budget of $2 billion and a staff of 600 people. Uh, I was commenting to Griff when I was talking to him just now, I wish it was far more than $2 billion that you had in your coffers. He is a wonderful steward of these resources and an acclaimed leader in all respects of uh, medicine today. He received his undergraduate degree at Brown, went to medical school at Brown, trained in internal medicine at Washington University in St. Louis, and then in hematology at the NIH and at George Washington University uh, School of Medicine. He's made contributions in clinical trials over the years, including a seminal observation that hydroxyurea would help patients with sickle cell disease, which was made in the 1990s. That observation has, of course, in a positive way, affected the lives of millions of people around the world, and over 90,000 individuals in the United States who suffer from sickle cell anemia. He's the author 
of 200 scientific manuscripts and papers. He's edited four books, four scholarly books on different subjects. He owns three patents, and he's been decorated with membership in the most prestigious scientific societies in our country, including the American Society for Clinical Investigation, the Association of American Physicians, and the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy. In all ways, uh, Dr. Rogers is a leader, a leader of course, for leading this important institute of the National Institutes of Health. I had the privilege of working with him when I was on the council of the NIDDK, and I can say firsthand his thoughtful, careful stewardship of this important national resource is in excellent hands, uh, in Griff Rogers' hands. His topic tonight is science, a tool for justice, a subject about which he is expert. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our Frank Bryant lecture to the podium, Dr. Griffith Rogers. Thanks so much. Thanks for right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you for that very warm uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Berggren, Dr. Henrich, uh, members and family, students, uh, good friends. I want to thank you for this wonderful invitation. It's really always a delight to come to this beautiful city. I have to say it was my last time here was about 20 years ago, uh, but I was here several times for, for that. Uh, and it's even better to have the opportunity to, to spend uh, time with, I think, very remarkable medical professionals, scientists, teachers, uh, and students. Uh, though I thought it was somewhat odd when I first got the invitation, I understand that the location was going to be the basement of the Alamo. <coughs> but fortunately, we're in a much finer facility, one that actually exists. And so it's definitely a pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, we're at really an outstanding institution uh, of higher education, uh, one that is doing great work preparing our future physicians, uh, nurses, dentists, biomedical researchers, uh, and caregivers of, of all stripes. Uh, most impressive is this Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics. This is uh, a, a really a singular place in this country because you're really going beyond the technical knowledge uh, to emphasize ethical practices and community services, uh, to put students' skills and talents in the service and the compassion uh, and justice, which are really important uh, uh, efforts. There's so much I have to say that I admire about this place, uh, your academic excellence, your focus on nurturing empathy uh, and humanitarianism, uh, your efforts to ensure that all students uh, will uh, be attentive to the patient's uh, thoughtful uh, care throughout the, the patient's uh, life. And your interdisciplinary community uh, service learning program that's so important. It connects students, what students learn in the classroom to what they experience uh, out in the, in the community. Your commitment to serving the underserved and your dedication to diversity. These are all so important. So with that in mind, I, I would have to say that it's especially important, it's a special privilege to be here today, but it's also a very humbling honor to deliver the lecture that honors the life and legacy of Dr. Frank uh, Bryant, Jr., a pioneer who you've heard about, who've overcome adversity to make groundbreaking improvements in medical career for the people of East San Antonio. I never had the privilege to, to know Dr. Bryant, but I do know of his work. Uh, and in more ways than one, I think all of us uh, stand on his very broad and strong shoulders. Dr. Bryant was not a great African-American physician. He was a great physician, period. No qualifiers are necessary, uh, nor should they be for any of us. Uh, that, but he was certainly a strong inspiration to anyone wanting to enter the field of health or science, anyone who experienced discrimination or disrespect, or anyone who'd ever been told that they're not likely uh, to amount to very much, anyone who was judged by the color of their skin and not for the way uh, that you think and how deeply you think. So in a sense, uh, by his very example of pursuing his passion uh, as a physician, as a healer, 
as an advocate uh, to the highest possible level, Dr. Bryan showed us all one way that science and medicine can be powerful tools for justice. And that's one of the things that makes me so passionate about uh, NIDDK, the institute that I have the privilege to be the director of, the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases. It's because of the areas that uh, were within our mission areas. These disorders are really at the core of our portfolio, obesity, diabetes, kidney disease. They're all chronic, they're common, they're consequential, and they're costly. And uh, many of them are likely to afflict African Americans, Latino, and other people of color disproportionately. Which means that each time we make a new groundbreaking uh, um, uh, trial and preventing or in better treatments of this disorder, we're really striking a blow for justice. And we also often hear the term health disparities, but we can also think of this in, in another way as really health injustice. And I want you just for a moment to consider the facts that as an African American adult, uh, compared to a non-Hispanic white adult, you're more than 1.5 times more likely to have diabetes. You're 70 percent more likely to be diagnosed with, with uh, diabetes. Uh, you're more than twice as likely to die from diabetes. And you're ne nearly three times as likely uh, to go on dialysis. Of course, in this country, diabetes is a leading cause of end-stage kidney disease which uh, requires dialysis. Despite this fact that African Americans are only 13 percent of the population, they represent 33 percent of the population on dialysis or those patients who require a kidney transplant. And unfortunately, they generally end up being last on the list of the transplant recipients. Look at the, the Hispanic population. These numbers are quite likely are quite the same. They're 1.5 times more likely to be obese. They're 1.7 times more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes. Uh, 1.5 times more likely to die of diabetes. Again, uh, about 60 percent more likely to start treatment for end-stage kidney disease and uh, related to diabetes. And Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans are really the most likely uh, um, among uh, all Hispanic to fall into this category. Another example of he health injustice. Asian uh, American Indians, Native Alaskans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders also fall into these categories. Obesity leading to diabetes, leading to uh, uh, kidney disease. It's not only the fact that they're more likely to have these conditions, but it is clear that one's ability to pay for uh, things that would uh, improve uh, your likely outcome of these diseases, eating better, taking your medication, following uh, um, what, what are generally uh, the best available prescribed methods, will change in these populations as well. Here's a, a study that we funded in a group uh, from Boston who looked at the issue of uh, health care resources, and they measured various measures of economic insecurity. What they found that in 39 percent of the respondents, they all reported at least one material needs insecurity. 19 percent reported food insecurity. 28 percent pointed out that the cost of medication uh, was a reason that they underused the medication as prescribed. Housing instability, over 10 percent energy insecurity, not knowing whether you would have fuel in your house or fuel in your car to either t get you to work or keep you warm during the uh, winter months. These are, are quite dramatic. The most striking uh, finding in this uh, study that was just recently published uh, about two months ago is that even despite the fact that many of these patients had comprehensive health insurance or some type of health insurance, 46 percent of these respondents who were all uh, diabetics because of these insecurities, this led to poor diabetes control. 
And of course, we know that poor control will lead to the secondary complications associated with diabetes uh, and uh, shorten uh, one's overall survival. So what I'd like to tell you a little bit about in, in some of the time allotted is the type of integrated research program at NIDDK that we're involved in to try to work on what we consider these health disparities or these health inequities or health injustice. We're the principal institute responsible for obesity research. It's the obesity epidemic in this country that's driving the diabetes, specifically the adult onset or type 2 diabetes. And in turn, it's type 2 diabetes that's driving the kidney disease problem that we have, specifically chronic kidney disease leading to end-stage kidney disease, uh, patients requiring dialysis or a transplant. Now, I mentioned in, in my series of, uh, of, of sli in, uh, slides the fact that they're common and they're costly. Let me give you an example of that. Obesity in this country is thought to affect two-thirds of the U.S. adults are considered to be either overweight or obese. Approximately one-third are considered obese. This is increasing in the young, as I'll show you in a moment. And the, uh, the average cost, or the estimated cost, uh, is $147 billion a year associated with the obesity problem. Diabetes uh, is thought to affect 29 million Americans, or 9.3 percent of the adult population. Now, this is an entirely type to diabetes, about 5 or 10 percent of that may be type 1. But nonetheless, it's projected that if we don't do anything differently, that by the year 2050, 50 million Americans will be affected by diabetes. Again, increasing in the young, studies actually from this institution have pointed that out and put that in very sharp contrast that when these kids develop what we used to call adult onset diabetes, it's a much more aggressive disease. The complications are occurring much earlier. So we have to do something to uh, stem this tide. The annual cost estimated two years ago now, and I'm sure this number is much higher, an annual cost of $245 billion a year. And then diabetes leading to chronic kidney disease, 23 million Americans affected by CKD, leading cause diabetes, the annual cost, uh, because all of these patients, once they develop end-stage kidney disease, go on dialysis, are covered by Medicare, an underestimate, but a number coming in at $29 billion. These are just the economic costs. I mentioned that the, the condition is, uh, is common. And let me just show you on this slide that it is really this obesity epidemic that's driving the type 2 diabetes. Our sister institute, the Centers for Disease Control, or the CDC, put together these uh, pictures uh, every five years. You can see that uh, in the last 20 years, the prevalence of obesity in this country uh, has greatly increased from less than 14 percent in a few states in the Midwest and the far west, uh, 14 to 17 percent, but then moving into 2010, you can see a much larger uh, number of states with uh, over 26 percent uh, obesity. And if you look at the similar analysis that they do for diagnosed diabetes, you can see that as the states change colors, those states are also changing colors for diagnosed diabetes. I have to say that one of the first things that I did, actually, when I became the director, I was asked to give a congressional briefing to the Congressional Diabetes Caucus. This is a bipartisan group that wanted to hear this information. And when I showed them these slides, I realized halfway in the middle of this that I was showing them these blue states that were becoming red states. And I realized quickly that I didn't want to make a political statement, so I attributed this to the Centers for Disease Control, where this, uh, this, this data is housed. Of course, everything is big in Texas, right? This Texas, uh, a slide of Texas just clearly indicates that while uh, San Antonio here has generally the, the uh, national uh, average uh, in Bayhar County, the incidence of diabetes is uh, pretty close to the average. But there are a cluster of counties uh, going out to the east and even to the, the west, um, Fayette, Gonzales, DeWitt, Lavaca counties, uh, down to the coast, 
the rate of diabetes is much higher. That's also uh, another cluster of counties in the West, including Gillespie, Kerr, and Bandera counties, in which these counties really have extremely high uh, prevalence of, of diabetes, much greater than the national uh, average. One of the things that's driving the adult obesity problem is childhood obesity. And I think everyone is uh, quite familiar with uh, this because this has gotten a lot of public attention uh, very recently, including efforts by the Surgeon General, the First Lady, uh, uh, and a number of others. But overweight in youth is really a problem. And, and again, as I said, youth with, who are overweight are driving the uh, type 2 diabetes in the youth, and this is really a major problem, something that we have to do something about. It turns out that we haven't always had this problem with uh, overweight or obesity in childhood. In fact, um, in the early 70s, when kids all had physical education and we were eating home-cooked meals, there were generally uh, only about 2 to 4 percent of the population of kids either 6 to 11 indicated here in the red or in the blue 12 to 19 uh, were considered overweight or obese. Of course, the way one considers obesity uh, or overweight in childhood is slightly different than what we uh, attribute this in the adult, the body mass index. It really results from looking at them on so-called growth charts. But it's clear that something happened here in the mid-70s, uh, first in the young kids, in which there was a pronounced increase, followed by a, a little bit of a lag period, but then one saw this coincident rise in the, uh, the older kids, 12 to 19 years of age. And of course, I'm sure there were many variables that occur, but let's consider a few things that happened around the mid-70s that may have led to that. The introduction of the first cell phone was in 1973. Can you imagine walking around with this thing in, uh, in your pocket uh, today? In 1973, also, the Egg McMuffin sandwich was first uh, introduced uh, in this country. The first drive through McDonald's, uh, actually in 1975, in a neighboring state uh, uh, in, in Arizona, Sierra Vista, Arizona, uh, came into existence. The very first portable computer uh, shown here uh, came out in 1977. And in 1977, Atari launched its very first video game, the Atari console. Now, I don't want to give direct uh, attribution to these events, but what I think that this led is to a culmination of events associated with, again, less physical education uh, in schools that really set a stage for um, uh, a series of events that led to the fast availability of high caloric food readily available as well as things that would encourage a more sedentary lifestyle such as sitting in front of a computer, TV screen, and of course cell phones that are not quite that big but allowing one to uh, always be uh, relatively uh, inactive. What are the consequences of obesity uh, in addition to diabetes that I will focus on? Well, here's a, a picture that appeared in the National Geographic by one of our investigators. This is what's called a sagittal section uh, through an MRI section through a female, 36 years of age, 120 pounds. Her height is five uh, feet, five inches. Uh, looking at her ratio of her height to weight, this would give her a body mass index of 20, which would be considered entirely normal. And in fact, you see very little fat uh, in this MRI. Now consider a female slightly older, uh, who we also take an, took an MRI on, age 40. She weighs 250 pounds, about the same height. This gives her a BMI of 40, which makes her extremely obese. And as you look at the MRI, you see all this whitish laden area, which is fat depositing not only uh, in the subcutaneous space, but also uh, in these organs. Having obesity really leads to a number of complications stroke, uh, hyper, uh, cataracts, 
coronary uh, heart disease, pulmonary disease, uh, liver uh, disease, gallbladder. It's now clearly associated with a number of cancers, breast cancer, uterine cancer, esophageal, uh, probably pancreatic, gynecological uh, complications. But for the purpose of this talk, we're gonna talk about how it's leading uh, its association with diabetes and how this, this uh, epidemic can be reversed. Diabetes really is a ticking uh, time uh, bomb in this country. From a perspective of uh, 24 hours in the United States, every 24 hours there are over 4,600 new cases of diabetes uh, in this country. There are 200 non-traumatic amputations of the lower limb that occur in operating rooms throughout the United States. About 136 people begin dialysis because of kidney failure attributed to their diabetes, and 641 patients will die uh, with uh, diabetes. Diabetes is listed as the seventh leading cause of death in this country, but because it's such a great contributor to stroke, uh, and to heart disease, as I'll show you in a moment, and also associated with those cancers, that seventh leading cause is probably a gross underestimation. Diabetes uh, can affect anyone. Fame and fortune really are no deterrence. As you can see on this slide, here are some very famous personalities with diabetes. In the center, you see uh, Paula Dean, of course, who um, spent uh, and champion recipes and, and foods that were very conducive to developing uh, the disease. And in a sort of ironic way now, she's actually a spokesperson for some of the pharmaceutical companies that actually have drugs to treat uh, diabetes. On the right, you might recognize this famous singer, Luther Vandross. Uh, not only did Luther Vandross uh, have diabetes, but his father, uh, several brothers, uh, many other first-degree relatives. Luther Vandross uh, had a stroke and lived or, in a coma basically for two years when he eventually died. And at the time, not many people associated, they realized that diabetes could cause blindness, kidney failure, but not many people associated diabetes with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke but that was his case, as well as the case of his uh, other family members. So on the lower panel here is the mayor for life in Washington, D.C., Marion Barry. Marion Barry had diabetes, complicated also with high blood pressure, which led to his heart failure, which caused him uh, to die. He also uh, had end-stage kidney disease, and despite the fact that I told you that uh, African Americans with kidney disease are less likely to develop to get a, a transplant. Uh, a, a campaign donor actually donated a kidney to Mr. Barry in 2009, and he had that for, for quite some time. But he ultimately uh, uh, succumbed to his disease uh, last November. Just want to point out here in the, in the corner, because she's been a very good spokesperson, Selma Hyatt who some of you may recognize. She had gestational diabetes, which affects somewhere between four to six percent of pregnancies. It's especially common in the Hispanic community. Many of these women will go back to normal glycemia once they deliver their child, but they're always at very high risk for developing type two diabetes, and she's been a, a very powerful advocate uh, for this. So with all of this, what is the role of research? What can we do about this national epidemic of obesity and, and diabetes uh, and its dire health consequences? Uh, modern uh, inequities that place an unequal burden, in a sense, uh, on people of color. One critically important step is research to develop new ways to prevent obesity and diabetes before it occurs, because I think we would all agree that prevention is preferable to treatment but because we have so many individuals suffering from uh, diabetes this day, we obviously have to develop a better treatment methods as well. That really brings me to, to my next slide, and again on diabetes, when we talk about health and justice. Diabetes affects 29 million Americans, 
uh, but roughly eight million of them are unaware that they have the diagnosis. If you're not diagnosed, of course, you're not being treated adequately. The disease is uh, taking a cumulative toll on you, and therefore the secondary complications are likely to be much greater, and a shortened survival is likely to, to be uh, uh, in store for you. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are now estimated to be, be about 86 million Americans who suffer from prediabetes, a condition in which the blood sugar is not high enough to, to actually be called a diabetic, but it's much higher than normal. And certainly these individuals with prediabetes are at extreme high rate of uh, or, or risk of going on to develop diabetes some uh, time uh, within the, uh, their life uh, uh, span. So how do we begin to chip away uh, at some of these patients so they don't actually uh, develop uh, diabetes? Well, that's what I'd like to tell you about over the next uh, few minutes. We now know from studies from a number of centers, uh, including here uh, in San Antonio, that there is a progression between normal to the pre-diabetic state to the type 2 diabetes state, and then finally to complications. And as a direct result of this, in NIDDK, we've put together a number of trials, both in adults and children. Some of them will be familiar to many of you in the audience who participated in these trials uh, to prevent people at high risk from developing even prediabetes or those with prediabetes from going on to develop type 2 diabetes and trying to treat people early in the onset of their type 2 diabetes to try to reverse this to a more normal stage. One of the most frequent questions I'm asked by someone with diabetes is, doctor, am I gonna have this for the rest of my life and is there a way to reverse that? And that's something that we're very actively working on. What I'd like to tell you though about is our diabetes prevention trial, a trial set up to really do exactly that, prevent people or delay people who have prediabetes from going on to develop uh, diabetes. Let's see. The DPP study involved some over 3,200 participants, 45% of whom were minority, because again, this is a population at greatest risk. There were three treatment arms, standard instruction plus placebo, standard instruction with metformin, and a lifestyle intervention uh, in one of the groups, and they were roughly allocated, randomized to each of these groups. Let me tell you a little bit about the lifestyle intervention because of the, 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 the very much the success of this study. This was an intensive behavioral modification program with the goal of a 7% weight loss uh, accompanied by a reduction in their calorie intake uh, and also with exercise, 150 minutes per week of physical activity, 30 minutes a day, five days a week, largely just walking. You don't have to join an expensive uh, athletic club, uh, just walking was sufficient. This intervention, uh, this behavioral intervention was delivered at 16 sessions, a core curriculum D done on a one-on-one -on -one basis over a period of 24 weeks, and then there was a monthly visit to reinforce what was learned uh, during these 16 sessions. What was the outcome? Over this three-year period, you can see that in general, the people receiving placebo uh, uh, went on to develop diabetes somewhere between 8% to 10% of them developed. But in every racial and ethnic group, the, um, the uh, observation was the same, that metformin showed some degree of protection, but the best protection was the individuals who were in this lifestyle group. Again, that was in every racial and ethnic group, I'm sorry, I'm losing the point in here, every racial and ethnic group that we examined. Now, while there weren't very much differences in, the, in these uh, interventions in these racial and ethnic groups, as it turns out, when we looked at other variables, it turns out that there were. And these are not as uh, uh, readily uh, known, and so I want to bring them to your attention. When we looked at the group receiving this drug, metformin, which as many of you may know is the first drug that's usually used for treatment for people with uh, diabetes, 
while the, uh, in the uh, very young group, metformin seemed to be as effective as a lifestyle intervention. In the older group, you can see that metformin shown here in red, I'll just have to point it out, was really not statistically different than what one sees in the placebo. So obviously metformin was, was, has its greatest effect in the younger population. In contrast, and almost counterintuitively, the lifestyle intervention involving exercise and diet uh, uh, use was actually very effective. While it was effective in all groups, it was most effective actually in the group who at the beginning of the study were over the age of 60. In fact, if you looked at the reduction between placebo and the, uh, and the lifestyle, in fact, they enjoyed a 71% reduction in the prevention of developing uh, diabetes. And so this is why I say it was counterintuitive because going into this study, there were many critics to say, you'll never get people over 60 to exercise 30 minutes a day, five days a week. And even if you can get them through that 16 week period, they're not gonna maintain this for over a period of three years. Well, the critics were wrong. This beneficial effect was seen and it was most prominent in those adult patients. Now, something I did wanna come back to is that when I referenced Selma Hyatt, what, the, what this study clearly showed was that women with a history of gestational diabetes, or GDM, were really at a severe high risk of developing diabetes. If you consider those uh, women who received placebo, who had a history of gestational diabetes, and compare those to women who did not have a history of gestational diabetes, there was a 71% increase in them developing diabetes in that group. So if you have gestational diabetes, this puts you at a very high risk of, of developing, and you have to watch them very carefully. In this group, the metformin, again, was just as effective, about a 50% reduction uh, in the uh, development of diabetes compared to placebo. And you can see the metformin was not very effective in these women without a history of gestational diabetes. So to summarize, metformin seems to be extremely effective in the young, and particularly in women with a history of gestational diabetes. Whereas, of course, this lifestyle intervention is effective in everyone, but it's especially effective in people over 50 or, or over 60, it's dramatically effective. This slide just uh, summarized what I just said about that. Initially in this trial, there was a 31% reduction uh, uh, with metformin compared to placebo, 58% with uh, lifestyle. These effects were durable. After, if you follow these patients for 10 years, there was still an 18% reduction uh, with metformin arm and 34% with lifestyle. This led us to do a follow-up study because obviously it's too costly to provide this one-on-one -on -one intervention with these 86 million Americans that have prediabetes. So we figured if we we're gonna make this very practical, we had to translate this somehow in a community based way that could potentially give this type of instructions on a, in a group setting. So we chose the YMCA to do a, a, the so-called translation research. Why the why? Well, there are 2,600 YMCAs in this country and about 68 million households live within a three mile radius of a YMCA. So you see with that in mind, we're now be able potentially to get a a crack at that 86 million Americans who are at high risk. And when you do this in a group setting, you're actually able to reduce the cost of providing this intervention. You're able to, to, to reduce this by about a fifth. So it then becomes quite cost effective to deliver it. And in fact, the studies from the YMCA in fact showed that the weight loss reduction and the prevention of diabetes at three years were quite similar to what we were able to achieve on a one-on-one -on -one basis and therefore it's a great possibility of scaling up this intervention. When one looks at this from a provider standpoint, if you had to actually pay the cost, in fact, this was published in the Diabetes Care a couple of years ago, but from a provider standpoint, lifestyle intervention was highly cost effective. What that means is that if you look at the cost, hospitalizations, medicines, lost, lost hours, and the people receiving placebo, and you add that up, 
and you put those same costs together with the people receiving lifestyle, despite the fact that you're paying so much up front to actually give them these instructions, over a 10-year uh, period, lifestyle was, even, uh, was still highly cost effective. Metformin, on the other hand, even though it was only about a half as effective as the lifestyle, because it's a generic drug readily available, in fact, it was actually cost savings. So these type of health economic studies are really embedded in all of our large clinical trials. We began to ask the question, though, at that point, since this was a fairly large randomized trial, we asked the question, well, what is it that's preventing us from preventing type 2 diabetes? because this would have enormous economic and human uh, benefit if one could, could expand these types of studies. And so my colleagues and I wrote a perspective in the New England Journal, and what we realized at that time was that there was really limited coverage for testing for either diabetes or prediabetes. And so if you're not tested, and the people who are in charge of this is the United States Preventative Task Force, they hadn't actually given it either an A or B rating, which was necessary in order for uh, Medicare and Medicaid to, reinsure, to, to pay for these um, uh, testing and then treatment, and ultimately for the management. And um, lifestyle, limited coverage for lifestyle intervention. But I have to say that having presented this a number of times and beginning to agitate the U.S. Preventative Task Force, I'm uh, pleased to say that just in October, they did consider it and now have given a B rating uh, to um, screening for abnormal blood glucose for type 2 diabetes in adults at high risk. Once this is implemented, I think that this is really going to have a major impact uh, to begin to, to, to bend that cost curve that I pointed to you, the $245 billion. Unfortunately, at the moment, F, uh, metformin is still not FDA approved because the drug, the company that actually supplied the drug for this trial, Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, who, who held the patent, there's really no financial incentive for them to uh, put in an IND for a drug that's now generic. There's not likely to be a return on investment. And then there's an enormous cost associated with putting this in front of the FDA. But again, that's another area that we continue another place that among colleagues we're continuing to edge and, and nudge a bit. So how do we uh, translate this into a public health setting? Uh, DPP uh, has partnered, uh, NIH has partnered with the CDC to form the National Diabetes Education Program in which we target the message about diabetes prevention and treatment to specific uh, groups. We work very closely with the Indian Health Service because of the very high rate of diabetes among the Indians. And here, I think we are beginning to make a major difference in terms of the prevention because they were employing these prevention program in their uh, uh, special uh, diabetes prevention program in the Indian uh, population. As I mentioned, we partner with the Y. The results of this trial has now led the CDC uh, to develop their own national diabetes prevention program in which the CDC is actually certifying people who are in being instructors to teach this lifestyle intervention. And we continue to move even further uh, with this. Uh, one way that we figured we could get a two for uh, in a translational effort that's underway is to actually instruct people who have diabetes themselves to be instructors for people who have prediabetes. In that sense, they actually are not only teaching them how to prevent developing diabetes, but in the process, they're actually taking better care of their diabetes themselves. And we're actually seeing enormous benefits on actually both occasion. And hopefully, if we can replicate these in other centers, we may be able to advance this, this effort in a much greater way. What I've told you is really focused on adults. But now we realize that the environmental factors are very important in terms of developing diabetes. When we think about the environment, we frequently think about the air we breathe, the food we eat, the pollutants that we come in contact with. But now we know that actually our environment begins very early. In fact, probably in the womb, our, we uh, have signals uh, and exposures that actually can determine in advance the likely chronic diseases that we're likely to develop. 
In fact, in studies on uh, the Pima Indians uh, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, in which we've had an intramural program now for the last 45 years, that group has shown very conclusively that a pregnant woman, particularly if she is obese, who either has diabetes or develops gestational diabetes, is likely to pass that trait on to the infant. Uh, and in fact, unfortunately, if that infant is a daughter, she is likely to become a young woman with obesity and or diabetes, and that vicious cycle will continue to swirl. And in fact, this cycle would actually predict that the children would, or that, that the incidence of diabetes would become, begin to occur at a much earlier age. This is exactly what we're seeing. These results have now been substantiated uh, by several other uh, investigators, and it's actually led us to uh, work with our colleagues at the NIH to develop ways to try to prevent um, uh, the excessive weight gain during pregnancy, which would potentially have enormous benefits both to the mother as well as to the infants. Everything in the government has an acronym. This is called Life Moms, which stands for Lifestyle Interventions for Expecting Moms. And we're looking at a variety of behavioral interventions that might decrease the excessive weight loss, that uh, weight gain that can occur during the course of pregnancy, and actually following both the moms as well as the infants for one to two years uh, after the delivery uh, to see the impact of those, uh, those behavioral interventions. It's important that we base any recommendations ultimately that we give on this type of evidence-based science to try to counteract some of the mixed messages that one might see in the community. Here's a picture that I took in Washington actually very recently. Here's the kind of mixed messages that people are seeing. You see on the top, childhood obesity, don't take it lightly. And that's co right under that is a slide saying uh, uh, my kind of shopping spree at McDonald's. Um, I don't have anything against McDonald's. I eat at McDonald's from time to time. So please don't, uh, anyone in the audience who happens to be a journalist, please don't say that I'm saying bad things about McDonald's. These are the kinds of messages that we all see day in and day out. And we have to somehow balance these types of messages with evidence-based messages targeted at specific populations to try to get them at least a message to resonate for a period of time because unless a message sticks, it's not likely to be followed. So based upon the types of research that we've done, we've developed a number of, of uh, information networks. One is called WIN, or the Weight Control Information Network. Uh, we've uh, tried to instill in these messages that are on the website as well as um, in uh, literature that are readily available, information from people at all ages on healthy eating, on exercise, as well as uh, nutrition. And we, again, try to target it to specific populations uh, at greatest risk. A subset of this win is our program called Sisters Together, Move More, Eat Better, uh, based upon the observation that somewhere between uh, 20 to 25 percent of, of, of African-American women are, are thought to be uh, obese, and perhaps 50% or even two and three uh, may be considered to be overweight. In this particular program, we try to target messages, again, at all ages, giving helpful tips on both exercise, physical activity, as well as, as nutrition. And I would definitely encourage uh, people to visit the website to learn more about that. We also have that National Diabetes Education Program that I mentioned uh, that we do in partnership with the CDC and 200 private and public partners. We uh, have all this material in both English and Spanish, and it's not just translating from English to Spanish, but we get in the groups of, of individuals to make sure that this is uh, tailored, uh, linguistically appropriate, and socially acceptable manner that is likely to stick and resonate so that people are likely to follow uh, uh, what our message is. Because type 2 diabetes is becoming more common in adolescents, we have information for adolescents. 
It's actually written now in uh, some 14 Asian and Pacific Islander languages, and we're seeing that uh, this is being picked up by a lot of the pharmaceutical chains as their definitive information to provide uh, to individuals in these populations on either treating or preventing uh, diabetes. It's not all about the behavior. In the last few uh, minutes, let me just say something about the genes. Normally, when people give these types of talk, they spend a lot of time about the science of the genes and the proteome and the genome uh, and the uh, other ohms that I guess the omics are really big, uh, are, are really in. I think there's uh, proteomes, there's ribosomes, there's nucleosomes, uh, there's epigenome. It's really uh, only limited, I guess, by uh, economes. Uh, but in any case, in terms of the genome, we're, we're, we're trying an experiment which is somewhat unprecedented. Actually, we uh, have worked now with 10 biopharmaceutical companies and 12 nonprofit organizations to develop a way based upon people's genetic predispositions to develop better ways to treat people with diabetes or to prevent complications associated with diabetes. There are three groups uh, or three diseases that are actually targeted in this accelerating medical partnerships. Uh, not only type 2 diabetes that I'll tell you a little bit about, but lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, as well as Alzheimer's. And the whole goal of this project is really to develop better promising biological targets of the disease or to at least in the case of Alzheimer's and lupus to develop better biomarkers or diagnostics uh, for these conditions. Now in diabetes, we had the advantage that for a number of years, we've actually been working on the genetics of type 2 diabetes. Uh, in fact, shown on this uh, slide are the 26 pairs of human chromosomes and the site of specific mutations in genes or in regions of the genes that either increase or lowers one's risk for diabetes. In 2011, there were 49 examples of these uh, specific uh, regions, uh, but this has really been an area of virtual explosion. Just within the last three years, there have been an additional uh, 28. So we're up to close to 80 uh, genes or gene regions. And again, we've uh, now uh, have available uh, descriptions and populations uh, uh, close to about 200,000 uh, individuals that we're studying. About a half a year ago, a very interesting uh, mutation arose from this, a uh, mutation in a particular gene called SLC30A8, which is a zinc finger gene. It's a transporter in islet cells for the, uh, for the metal zinc. And what we found is that in certain populations, there are mutations in this particular gene that causes a gain of function. So this put people at extremely high risk of developing diabetes. But we've also found very rare mutations which actually result in a loss of function of this gene, particularly in individuals who are overweight and elderly, individuals who you would expect would be at a very high risk of developing diabetes. They seem to be protected from diabetes. And in fact, when we went back in, and our investigators went back in and actually searched various ethnic groups, you can see here African Americans, Europeans, uh, Southeast Asians, or Southern Asians and East Asians, it turned out that there are certain of these mutations that increases one chance of developing diabetes, but there are other rare mutations which seems to occur in each of these populations which actually protect people. So essentially knocking out one of these genes actually protects one from developing diabetes. And so what we're doing in this partnership is making all of this information readily available on a knowledge portal so that not only researchers but people from the pharmaceutical industry can come in and interrogate these genes to allow one to look for new targets that could either prevent diabetes or better treat diabetes or prevent some of the complications associated with diabetes. And I think you're going to be learning more and hearing more and more about this in, uh, over the next four or five years. The way we're developing this knowledge porthole, though, is somewhat agnostic. Although we're using it for type 2 diabetes, we can similarly use such a porthole and we're exploring opportunities with people to look at schizophrenia, 
uh, to look in that lupus and rheumatoid arthritis cohort and Alzheimer's and other diseases and use the same general approach to develop better treatments for these patients. Well, just to conclude then, I think research is uh, certainly one area and the research that we do at NIH has really led to better ways to manage and perhaps prevent some of these uh, diseases. Type 2 diabetes, I've given you most of the information on what we learn really empowers people uh, uh, to be well enough, in a sense, to be emancipated uh, from these crippling diseases that are really associated with a degree of, of health uh, injustice. I think we have just begun the journey. We're certainly not at the end, uh, but I think there are very fruitful things that we're seeing uh, in the future. I really see all of this as an attempt, really, uh, for NIDDK to respond and it's very appropriate in Black History Month to what Dr. Martin Luther King issued a charge to really all Americans. And a quote that's, um, any of you who ever visit the Martin Luther King a Memorial will see, this is one of many quotes, is that life's most uh, persistent and urgent questions are what are you doing for others? What are you doing for others? Well, serving others is really the ultimate uh, mission of NIDDK. Serving others was Dr. Bryant's uh, mission. Uh, whatever field of healthcare, medicine, or science uh, you're involved in or you seek to go into, uh, I hope it will be your mission too. Because every time we identify a new way to prevent diabetes or we develop a new pathway that can be targeted to better treat people with kidney disease, I think we are, we are doing a lot. Uh, for every day, really in every way, it's really an important question, what are you doing for others? These are irreplaceable, precious human beings that we're, we're talking about. Uh, someone's son or daughter, someone's father or mother, someone's uh, brother or sister. So I just wanted to conclude uh, by showing you a picture of the NIH and as we focus really our collective uh, efforts on um, on developing new targets of, for disease, particularly for those who are least likely to receive proper treatment, those most at risk of dying. Uh, we serve them, we serve society, we serve the world, and we serve the cause of justice. Thank you again for this invitation. Hope I haven't gone too far over. And I certainly like to I prepare to answer uh, questions if there are some. Please use the microphone if you can. As you approach the microphone, uh, please do identify yourself and state your question succinctly for Dr. Rogers. And we do invite you, we have microphones on either side of the audience here to please, please come and engage with Dr. Rogers. Hi there, I'm a journalist. I write for the Rivard Report, but I'm also a social work grad student at the other school in town. I just wanted to ask you if based on this research you see some opportunity for mentoring as a way to transmit these healthcare concepts? Well, mentoring is, is, is clearly important. I mean, this is an area that uh, uh, we focus on actually quite heavily because if there aren't mentors for the next generation of, of scientists, of uh, physicians, and, and, uh, and other biomedical researchers, uh, I think the, the, the field would be uh, dead. Uh, and we begin, you know, at least within our institute, of a process of, of training and mentoring very early. We think, you know, because of uh, sort of some of the de deficiencies that we see in STEM education, now that high school isn't early enough. Um, we, we really want to capture people's attention about the excitement of science and, and engineering and math. And what we realize now is that particularly for some of these novel inventions, we, there really is an intersection between classical biomedical research and engineering, mathematics, 
Um, one example, a case in point, in which again, the importance of having mentors is the, in the case of patients with type 1 diabetes, we're trying to develop artificial pancreas, something, an external device that can replace the pancreas that's been destroyed because of their autoimmune process. Well, here's a case in which you obviously need endocrinologists who understand the disease, but you need engineers to develop, you know, uh, smaller and smaller devices that can be used. You need mathematicians and engineers to come up with appropriate algorithms to not only deliver insulin, but other hormones in a way that the, the body uh, normally does it in response to eating and fasting and exercise and other things. And so um, it's important that one has not only these scientists, but you have to have people that have a, a more holistic view of, of the, the issue uh, in mind, uh, you know, in place. And so that's an extremely important thing. And we spent a, an incredible amount of time, actually, both in our summer programs and our year-round programs to try to encourage mentoring and trainees at uh, appropriate levels. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk and for making the facts and figures so accessible. So there's some work that's being done here uh, in the Health Science Center by Ralph DeFranzo's group looking at um, early indicators of prediabetes. And they think, I don't know if Ralph is here, I don't want to speak for Ralph, but I don't, I don't know if he's here, but um, that looking at blood glucose and glucose tolerance tests is uh, finding problems late to too late in the ball game. And they've come up with uh, really cool ways to look earlier at, at islet cell function, which may be earlier indication that you're going to develop diabetes. The problem is those tests are expensive. They involve, uh, require a lot of sophisticated hardware. So you want to uh, make diabetes prevention accessible to lots of people, but it's an expensive technology to, to get them early. Mm -hmm. How's that going to figure into things? That's a very good, very good point. Uh, by the time that they've already sort of reached that threshold where their glucose tolerance test is, is abnormal, they may have not sufficient beta cell mass to preserve, to actually reverse that pathway. Actually, in that diabetes prevention program, we're able to do a number of things as ancillary studies. Since in this particular trial, uh, up until about six months from the time that they developed it, we know very precisely uh, in this effort. And of course, all of the serum and other biosamples from these individuals who at the time had prediabetes had been stored, we've actually uh, set up a number of trials, including using metabolomics and general non-biased proteomics. And there are actually groups, and you may be familiar with a study that was in Nature, that said that's actually a, a small number of, of, of amino acids actually predicted perhaps five years and maybe as much as seven years in advance of the people who would go on to develop diabetes uh, and who are at highest risk. So these types of early preventive biomarkers are critically uh, important. And again, you know, I know that they are expensive, but again, as, as the technology evolves, certainly people said that about the first human sequence, which cost over a million dollars. That's now under a thousand dollars and then we hope but this is another reason to bring in engineers and other uh, people from other disciplines to try to, to bring, uh, you know, uh, more uh, cost-sensitive uh, approaches uh, to doing these more generally, given the numbers that we're, we're working with. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for the lovely talk. I have a really quick question. If, if you don't mind, can, for, um, I guess, illustration purposes, can you please go back to the slide entitled um, Trends in Childhood Overweight Slash Obesity? I can try. Oh, sorry. For those of you in the audience who might have problems with seizures, please close your eyes. That's right. You unlearn it all, right? Forget what I said. Here's, oh, well. Yeah. Yeah, so when we're looking or comparing the um, overweight slash obesity rate in 1963 to uh, present, are we using the same definition? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this, again, <clears throat> the definition of obesity uh, uh, in adults 20 or older or 18 or older is really based upon the ratio 
of your height and weight, the so-called body mass index. And in general, uh, anyone with a body mass index of 20, as I showed you on that slide, are considered to have normal weight. If you're 20 to 24, you're considered to be overweight. 24 to 30, you're considered to be obese. If you're 40, you're considered to be, we don't like to term morbidly obese, but excessively obese. These are the patients that bariatric surgery are usually uh, applied to. In kids, it's slightly different. And if I, if, if I recall this correctly, this is really based upon being greater than the 90 or 95th percentile. There are pediatricians in the audience uh, who can tell, tell me whether I'm accurate or not. Based upon growth curves, uh, that were published by Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, I think largely out of Iowa. And so I don't know whether how generalizable those figures are, but I, I think that that's the broad idea. So if you're over 90% on that curve, you're considered to be overweight, and you're certainly in the 95th percentile, you're considered to be perhaps obese. Well, that, that seems to, that definition, I guess, seems to be really dependent upon what the growth Cur or growth curve is at the time of the study, right? So are we, I guess what my, what my concern is, are we comparing apples to apples as we look in, in time and try to compare the, the current rates of, of childhood obesity to the present? Yeah, these slides, so these, what, what these pictures indicate that they, they take from the CDC is that, you know, on an annual basis, they, they go out, mostly a lot of this is done with questionnaires, but there are some some physical measurements that are taken by the so-called NHANE study. And they actually do these measurements. The one thing that we know, particularly in adults, is that if you ask males, they generally overestimate their height, uh, and women generally underestimate their weight, uh, and everyone overestimates how much exercise they get. Um, but in this case, they actually measure their height and weight, and so they actually know precisely. So, they measure, they don't measure obviously all the kids, but they measure a substantial swath that they can then, based upon what the population is at that rate, they can tell what general percentage of the population fits these criteria. And so from early 60s they, through mid-2000s, they've been applying the same criteria uh, each time they do this, and so it's not a, it is an apples to apples comparison. And that's a good thing, apples to apples. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, Richard Usatine. I'm a family physician. I actually work in the center with Ruth Bergren and many of the other wonderful people uh, at the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics. And thank you so much for your presentation, for your advocacy. Um, I have a few questions. First, I just want to say that I have no doubt that we're seeing greater obesity. I have a nine-year-old girl in my practice who weighs 220 pounds, age nine. Um, so, but the one thing that, that always um, seemed like a great missed opportunity in our country is our public education. And I still, to this day, don't understand why we don't teach more about health, why we don't use more, you know, good uh, diet, good exercise programs, you know, not, not just, you know, one health class when you're a senior, but actually, you know, putting health education throughout the whole curriculum and, you know, through all the years of our public school and, you know, and there are all these fights about whether there's soda in the school, but, but to me it's so much more than that and I just wonder what we can do or what is being done to, to reach kids where we, we have them, you know, in, in our public schools. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you raise a, a very important uh, point. Obviously, there's been a lot of attention to the issue of childhood obesity, a number of of, of people have, have been really making a, a very public effort, uh, including the Surgeon General, the First Lady, uh, uh, and others. The uh, Robert Wood Johnson program has a program uh, called NCOR, which stands for the National, everything is an acronym, something for Childhood Obesity Research, National Coalition for Childhood Obesity Research. And they really uh, attempt to try to take the best practices in certain groups to extrapolate them uh, more broadly. But I think absolutely the schools have to be more involved. It's uh, perhaps above my pay grade, but all I can do is recommend studies that, we, that come in that we fund, two of which were actually involved here in San Antonio that were uh, extremely important. 
the, Teddy, uh, the, the Today study, which is a treatment option for diabetes of adolescents and youth, and also the Healthy study, which tried to target kids at high risk of developing diabetes. And this involved active uh, participation of the schools, especially the Healthy program, where in fact the school is a unit of randomization. Uh, healthy is, by the way, one of the few um, studies that we funded in which that's not an acronym, that's actually what the kids decided their, the name of their study should be. Um, but it did run into issues and there are people in the audience who are more, who were, you know, were actually participating in this could tell you about some of the issues related to taking and changing the school vending machine choices or making sure that every kid exercised and not a few of them and everyone else watched or you know, what was actually in the food that were prepared at the cafeteria. These are daunting uh, challenges, but uh, you know, we have to start somewhere. Thank you very much. Thanks. I think we, we're going to take one final question from the young lady who's here at the front, and, and thank you. Thanks. Okay, my name is Andrea Medina, and I work um, as a promotora uh, with people with uncontrolled diabetes. Um, I interact with uh, patients every day. I go to their houses and I get to know their stories. Um, one of the big barriers, um, I was expecting to hear something on your presentation, but um, you didn't touch much about mental health. And the, you did talk about the insecurities, food insecurities, housing insecurities. Um, but how um, I missed, uh, I wanted to know more, like what is the NIH doing? about, um, it's a big barrier. Um, so these people need a lot of resources. We don't have much, many resources here. How it's a barrier to, for them to control their diabetes in a way. So uh, it's really challenging us, me going to them and try to help them. I was wondering if there is, like what, what do you know or an approach that we can use or, or what? Yeah. Well, you raise a very important uh, fact uh, in terms of mental health and, and diabetes. If you have, I'm sorry. Turns out if you have diabetes, you're twice as likely to have depression. And if you have depression, you're twice as likely to develop uh, diabetes. Uh, given this coincident of event, our institute and the National Institute of Mental Health actually uh, had a, a workshop just two years ago uh, and the goal was to have something concrete in terms of defined projects that could move forward to kind of advance the field to provide the types of things that you're asking. Uh, while I, I have to say that uh, there were a, a few initiatives that were proposed, there really wasn't anything dramatic that, uh, that moved forward. This, this area is particularly uh, problematic not only in type 2 diabetes, but also in type 1 diabetes because of the overlying uh, uh, or, or the overlapping issues associated with adherence to, you know, using insulin and, and other uh, medication. So it's a very important problem. The field of mental health, as you know, uh, is something that I think only now people are beginning to realize it has to be destigmatized so that people can actually come forward and, and seek help. But that coincidence with diabetes is a very troubling one, and you're right. This study didn't talk about that. Um, uh, I was just talking about economic uh, issues. Uh, but this is an area in which we often, we do have a few examples of some behavioral interventions, but it really is nothing at the scale of some of these larger trials that I told you about. Dr. Rogers, we're, we're very grateful for your presence here. I, I can imagine that for a leader in a position such as yours, it's a constant challenge to think about, do we take the tools that we know work? We know that metformin can help a lot of people. We know that lifestyle changes can dramatically help a lot of people, even more so than metformin. Does the NIDDK now focus on getting those solutions to people that don't have access to them, or do you focus more on advancing science and looking at the genomics? And there's no right answer to that question, but it, considering that type of question requires wise leadership, and we're grateful to know that we have such a wise leader at the helm of NIDDK. And would the audience please join me in warmly thanking Dr. Rogers for his presentation.
Thank you for those kind words. That was very nice. Thank you.